Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Handling of Viscous Liquids, Basics, Techniques, and Tricks, presented by Dr. Hane Hanke, Content Editor, Eppendorf AG, Hamburg, Germany. I'm Alexis Krauss of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labberts and sponsored by Eppendorf. For more information on our sponsor, please visit eppendorf.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Hane Hanke. Dr. Hane Hanke is the content editor of Eppendorf Headquarter in Hamburg, Germany. She joined Eppendorf in 2015 as Application Specialist for Liquid Handling right after finishing her PhD in Medical Microbiology on the topic of S. epidermidis hip joint infections at the University Hospital in Hamburg. Hane focused on molecular biology and genetics early during her studies of biology at the University of Hamburg and deepened her knowledge in food microbiology laboratories and at Harvard Medical School in the group of Professor Roberto Coulter. A project management course in cooperation with Johnson & Johnson Medical, Germany, extended Dr. Dr. Hanke's skills in establishing trainings and giving seminars. For a complete biography on Dr. Hanke, please visit the biography tab at the top right of your screen. Dr. Hanke, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Alexis, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to present you today's webinar about viscous liquids and their handling in the lab. So first of all, I would like to give a brief description about viscosity and Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. So then I would like to point out the influence of viscous liquids on pipetting and describe proper pipetting of these challenging liquids. In the end, there will be a short summary. So, viscous liquids generally have a slow flow behavior, deriving from a high inner friction of molecules. Viscous liquids also have a much higher density than water. The density has to be taken into account for measuring the viscosity and all pipetting applications. There are two characteristics of viscosity of which both should be specified when describing a viscous liquid. The dynamic viscosity describes the moving liquid by considering the inertia of mass and resistance to shearing flows. The shear stress is proportional to the gradient of velocity. Velocity can also be determined as speed. So the more shear stress is applied, the faster the liquid flows. Dynamic viscosity is stated in millipascal seconds. It measures a fluid's resistance to flow when an external force is applied. The graphic on the right shows the definition of dynamic viscosity. The blue lines are plates and in between is a viscous liquid. If you start moving the upper plate, the liquid flows with the plate, but only in layers. So the first layer is faster than layer number two, and layer number two is faster than layer number three. You will need constant force to keep the upper plate moving. Otherwise, the high inner friction of molecules will stop the upper plate from moving. This also explains why liquid flow takes so long with viscous liquids and the thin layer of liquid remains to the surface. Kinematic viscosity describes the ratio of dynamic viscosity to the density of the fluid. Kinematic viscosity is stated as square meter per second. Kinematic viscosity is the resistive flow of a fluid under the weight of gravity. 
two fluids that have the same dynamic viscosity can have different kinematic viscosities. This is because kinematic results are dependent on the density of the fluid. Density is not a factor with dynamic viscosity. The differences between the two types of viscosity are that dynamic viscosity is related to the external force applied to the non-Newtonian fluids, while kinematic viscosity is the inherent viscosity of Newtonian fluids that does not change with a change in applied force. During this webinar, we will concentrate on the dynamic viscosity of fluids because we talk about moving these fluids with pipettes and dispensers. Therefore, dynamics are more important. But I will use Newtonian fluids as examples because they're more predictable. So, let's go over to Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids and their definitions. Viscous fluids can be further categorized in two categories, Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. A Newtonian fluid is easily described because its flow property is linear and the viscosity is independent of shear stress. For example, water. No matter how much pressure is applied to water, its flow behavior does not change. In contrast, non-Newtonian fluids react to shear stress and can be categorized in four classes. Shear thickening or thinning, thixotropic, and rheopectic. Let's have a closer look on these classes. Shear thickening fluids are mostly suspensions such as oblique, a mixture of cornstarch and water. Its viscosity increases with shear stress and it becomes less fluid when pressure is applied. In the moment the pressure is released, it returns to its initial state of fluidity. This funny viscous liquid can be used for experiments in school as it is harmless and easy to prepare. Shear thinning fluids react the other way around and become more fluid when stressed. So the fluid becomes more fluid, such as ketchup or tomato sauce, which gets more fluid after shaking the bottle. Rheopectic fluids also show increase of viscosity, but it is time dependent. Rheopectic fluids get less fluid over time when shear stress is applied, and it also takes at least the same time until it returns to its initial state. Thixotropic fluids react oppositely and become more fluid over time when constant shear stress is applied. For these fluids, it also takes time to return to the initial state. Basically, to remember, shear thickening and shear thinning liquids return to their initial state immediately when the shear stress is ending, while rheopectic and thixotropic fluids need time to return to the initial state. But how do we measure viscosity at all? Viscosity can be measured with viscosimeters. One example is shown here in the picture. This is a rotational viscosimeter. It can measure Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. For measurement, the fluid is filled into a beaker and the appropriate agitator is attached to the device. This agitator is turning and measures the shear or flow resistance in an unspecified value. With this value and a conversion formula list corresponding to the device, the dynamic viscosity can be determined. Please excuse for this chart being in German. I simply copied it from the operating manual of our device in the lab, but it shows the type of rotor used on the left side, the agitator speed in the first row, and the coefficients for multiplication to obtain the dynamic viscosity. So with this chart, you can uh, calculate the viscosity of the liquid that is inside the beaker. However, it is simpler to use capillary-based instruments, and in some cases, these are more accurate for determining uh, kinematic viscosity. This is usually a question of costs, which kind of viscosimeter you are using. 
We will now concentrate on Newtonian fluids because their behavior is easier to understand and more predictable than non-Newtonian fluids. Glycerol will be the main example because most of us are using it regularly in the lab for many different applications. But first of all, I would like you to answer a question. So how do you pipe at glycerol? And uh, we have four different answers. Please make your choice between one of them. So the first is, I cut the pipe at tip. The second is, I weigh my sample. The third is, I wait a long time during aspiration and dispensing. And the fourth possible answer is, I use reverse pipetting technique. So uh, we will wait a couple of seconds and so that you can read through the question and the answers. And um, you can choose the answer that fits best to what you are doing in the lab. We just wait until everybody made a choice. And um, then we can have a look at the results. So I will, I will wait a few more seconds, maybe five to 10 seconds. And I think then everybody will have made the choice how to pipe at glycerol at the moment in the lab. There's four different answers. I think some of you are still choosing their answer. Whether they wait a long time or they cut the pipe a tip or you're still weighing your sample or you're using a special pipetting technique for pipetting glycerol. So I think that um, all of you made a choice. Perfect, yeah. Okay, so what we see here, it's interesting. So most of you wait a long time during aspiration and dispensing, which is great because you have to, because it's a very slow flow. And uh, still, a lot of you are weighing the sample, which is also a way to deal with this. But you always have to calculate in the density then. Um, some of you are also using reverse pipetting technique, which is great, actually. We will talk about this a little later. And there are almost 22% still um, cutting the pipe at tip. So this is something I did during my PhD as well, I have to admit. But we will come to this a little later and what happens when pipe, uh, cutting the pipe itself. Okay, so during pipeting of viscous liquids, characteristic behaviors of the liquid show. Some liquid always remains in the pipe tip when classic pipes are used, as you see in the image on the right side. Often also air bubbles are additionally aspirated because the liquid has a very slow flow behavior. And when you pull out the tip before the liquid is aspirated completely, air is suddenly sucked into the tip. Less liquid is aspirated than the set volume, and pipetting viscous liquid leads to inaccurate pipeting results if the wrong pipeting technique and inappropriate pipeting tools are used. If you then think about using a multi-channel pipette for your application, the errors increase and often each channel of the pipette delivers different amount of viscous liquid. So inaccuracy multiplies when multi-channel pipettes are used. I will give a tip for applications with multiple samples later on, but as promised, let's go over to cutting the tip. Um, in the poll question, some of you answered that they are cutting off the pipe tip to aspirate glycerol. And I know that many other people are doing this in the lab as well. So as I already honestly said, I did this as well. Before getting deeper into the topic of accurate pipeting techniques. But when cutting the pipe tip, inaccuracy and imprecision increase dramatically. In this graphic, you can see the inaccuracy and imprecision of different pipe tips. The one on the left is an undamaged, complete pipe tip used for distilled water. Inaccuracy and imprecision are very low and within the acceptable error limits. When this tip is shortened by cutting off the tip and used with water, inaccuracy increases a lot and imprecision increases slightly. 
Now to take it to the top, glycerol is pipetted with a cut off pipette tip and as you see in the far right on the graphic, both inaccuracy and imprecision increase dramatically, leading to unreliable results. It is almost as bad as if one would only pour the glycerol from the bottle into the sample. So this is what happens when using classic pipettes, a cut off pipette tip and the wrong pipetting technique. Now we must take a step back and have a look on the pipettes themselves. The classic pipettes most of us are using are air cushion pipettes. The name derives from the air inside the pipette that is between the actual sample liquid and the instrument's piston. When the air is pushed out by pressing the top button, according to the amount of air, liquid is soaked into the pipette tip when the button is slowly released. As you can see, the liquid has direct contact with the air inside the pipette. This system is widely distributed and only suitable for aqueous solutions, since these pipettes are calibrated to water. Problematic viscous liquids with a higher density than water cannot be pipetted accurate without a special technique like reverse pipetting. We will discuss this technique in a minute. Um, less sensible are positive displacement pipettes, also known as stepper or dispenser. Here the liquid is soaked into a tip with an integrated piston. There is direct contact between the liquid and the piston and there is no air cushion. This system allows the transfer of all liquids, no matter if they have a high density or high viscosity. Dispenser are more precise and more accurate than air cushion pipettes with problematic liquids. The tip of a stepper or dispenser is filled once and then the liquid is dispensed in multiple steps. A positive displacement pipette, which works uh, with the same principle, is used for single aspiration and dispensing of challenging liquids. Nevertheless, Classic pipettes can be used with a special technique to facilitate working with viscous fluids so you don't have to buy a new device. So um, let's shortly go through the classic pipetting technique, which is forward pipetting. Um, every one of you is doing this in the lab almost every day, I guess. Pushing the operation button down to the first step aspirating the liquid and pushing to the second stop for dispensing, including the blowout. So this is daily business and most effective with aqueous solutions, buffers, etc. When using this technique with viscous fluids, some liquid remains in the tip because the air inside the pipe is compressed against the viscous liquid and the blowout cannot be executed properly. The slow flow behavior of viscous liquids additionally hinders the liquid flow from natural flow out. The set volume is never dispensed accurately. So let's have a look at the second technique and some of you already answered today are using reverse pipetting for their viscous liquids. This is the second technique and it's beneficial for viscous liquids. The operation button is pushed to the second stop then the set liquid volume, including the blowout volume, is aspirated. But while dispensing, the operation button is only pushed down to the first stop. Like this, the set volume is dispensed, but the blowout volume remains in the tip. This technique enables the pipette to dispense the set volume more accurately, and the blowout volume is a calculated remaining volume. If we now compare forward pipetting, reverse pipetting, and usage of a direct displacement device, when pipetting 50 microliter of 87% glycerol, we can see that forward pipetting, which is the brown line, leads to a massive variability in results, while reverse pipetting, which is the green line on top, is already more steady. Still, the usage of a positive displacement device leads to even more accurate results, also showing a high steadiness and reliability in each dispensing step. Positive displacement is therefore recommended with viscous fluids. Anyway, I will give some more tips for using 
classic pipettes in a few minutes. But first of all, I would like you to uh, no, first of all, I would like to tell you about multiple samples, as I promised in the beginning, and then I will ask another question. So, first of all, multiple samples. Um, I promise to give a tip on that. If you have to overlay your samples with glycerol for long-term storage or oil for PCR, I recommend using a stepper or dispenser instead of the multi-channel pipette. You will be able to aspirate the liquid once and then dispense one sample after the other with the same accuracy and precision. So this also makes your results much more comparable. Depending on the volume you need, only one filling of the tip is needed to dispense 96 times and the complete plate is finished. So you can save time and effort by increasing your accuracy, precision, and reproducibility. And I think that sounds great. So, now, we will go over to the next question. And um, since we talked a lot about positive displacement already, I would like you to answer if you use positive displacement devices for pipetting viscous fluids. We, again, we have four different answers. It's uh, yes, no, but I will consider it now, sometimes, or you're using a syringe, which is basically also a positive displacement device, um, just with, yeah, with not, not an attachable tip, because the tip is integrated in the, in the syringe. So again, we will wait a few seconds until everybody made the choice and read through the question. Um, I will repeat the question once. Do you use positive displacement devices for pipetting viscous fluids already? Um, you can answer either yes, no, but I will consider it now, sometimes, or I am using a syringe for the samples. So I will wait some more seconds until you have the time to make your choice. Maybe also some of your colleagues are with you in the lab or in front of the computer also going to answer. Okay, so I think, I think we are through and I uh, think you can see the results now. And most of you and that, that makes me really happy, so thank you very much. So you will consider now to use a positive displacement device for viscous liquids. This is great, and I think this is the best choice, the best answer you can give. Um, some of you are already using a positive displacement device, which is also very positive. I'm also very happy you're doing this. Um, sometimes it's also great. Maybe when we finish the webinar, you will think about using it even more often. And a syringe, which is already also a positive displacement device, is also a great choice. Um, but I have to admit, with a syringe, it's more difficult to get an accurate volume because you cannot set the volume in a syringe. It's either the full volume or it's um, more or less a guess of how much volume you're really uh, pipetting. Okay. So then let's go over to the part I think you're all waiting for. It's the tips and tricks for pipetting viscous liquids. There are three questions you have to ask first before starting to pipetting viscous liquids. Um, the first one is how viscous is the liquid? Is it low, medium, or high? And we will do the definition in the next slides. The second question is, is it a Newtonian or non-Newtonian fluid? Many non-Newtonian fluids cannot be pipetted due to their behavior under pressure, and these liquids must be weighed. So for those of you having these very challenging liquids, I'm sorry, you must still weigh them because they behave um, very unpredictable under pressure. And the third question is, what volume must be transferred? So small volumes from 1 to 1,000 microliters can be done manually, and larger volumes above 1,000 microliters should be pipetted with electronic devices to save time, 
and protect your hand and arm muscles from strain. I chose to organize the viscous fluids in three categories. Low viscosity, such as mechanical or edible oil, um, which is like 50% glycerol, with a dynamic viscosity less than 200 millipascal seconds. Medium viscous fluids, such as 86% glycerol, with less than 1,000 millipascal seconds. And highly viscous fluids, with a dynamic viscosity above 1,000 millipascal seconds, such as honey, skin cream, or 99% glycerol. So let us start with low viscous liquids. For these fluids, classic air percussion pipettes can be used and reverse pipetting is recommended for accurate results. Additionally, we recommend to pre-wet the tip for more accurate results. That means aspiration and dispensing of the liquid minimum three times before the actual liquid volume is transferred to the sample tube. You can compare this with flushing of the tip. If accuracy does not matter that much in the application, reverse pipetting is not mandatory. However, slow aspiration and dispensing speed is a must. Let's go over to medium viscous fluids. These can also be handled with classic pipettes, but reverse pipetting and pre-wetting is mandatory here. Also, a very slow aspiration and dispensing speed is a must. Furthermore, you can think about directly ordering a lower concentration of the liquid. The lower concentrated liquid would automatically have a lower viscosity. Additionally, you can think about preheating the liquid to at least room temperature because the warmer the liquids are, usually the less viscous they get. But this is not possible with some liquids. For example, enzyme solutions, which would lose activity when heated. So you always have to consider your sample. Another trick would be the pre-dilution of the liquid with larger volumes. This could also implement an additional error and less accuracy in the dilution step. So you have to make a choice there. So ideally, positive displacement devices should already be used with medium viscous liquids. Clear advantages are that no special pipetting technique is necessary and a high concentration of the viscous liquid can be used. Pre-dilution is not necessary and if you're using a dispenser or stepper, multi-dispensing facilitates the workflow and is more ergonomic than pipetting. If you want to go all the way for an electronic dispenser, you can also increase speed of aspiration and dispensing and protect your hand and arm muscles from strain. The switch from a medium to a highly viscous liquid is very smooth. So we set a limit at around 1000 millipascal second, which is slightly below 99% glycerol. Here I recommend to switch from a classic positive displacement tip to a special tip for highly viscous liquids, which has different properties and facilitates and simplifies working with these highly viscous liquids such as honey, paint, uh, or molasses, which is very sticky and viscous at the same time. Uh, so because when it comes to highly viscous liquids, like 99.9% .9 glycerol, most positive displacement devices and tips reach a limit. So they cannot take all the viscous liquids on the market. Therefore, a special tip for highly viscous liquids combined with an electronic dispenser is recommended. So strong aspiration and dispensing forces are applied to the positive displacement dispenser and your arm and hand muscles. That is why a manual device should not be used. The forces strain the arm muscles excessively and may lead to repetitive strain injury. Hence, it is important that the speed of aspiration and dispensing can be reduced to a minimum with an electronic dispenser to reduce the force needed and it must have an overstrain protection to prevent the motor from break breakdown. Additionally, we recommend to also pre-wet the special tip for highly viscous liquids. Like this, small air bubbles are eliminated and the dispensing result is most accurate. The liquid wets the inside of the tip and the liquid layers flow more easily. 
While at the same time, the piston wipes the tip from the inside to guarantee all liquid is delivered. Another advantage of using a special tip for viscous liquids is the reduction of aspiration and dispensing forces. <clears throat> This graphic shows that the forces needed can be reduced up to 79% by using a tip designed for viscous liquids compared to general positive displacement tips. This enables you to use a manual dispenser if you don't have an electronic device in your lab or it protects your electronic device from overstraining because the motor has less work and the battery is not stressed that much. So it makes sense to look out for uh, special, special devices for your special application to simplify work, make it easier for you, and protect your device so that you can work longer with the device you invested in. So now we are already um, almost at the end of the presentation. I will give a short summary now, what we just discussed in the last minutes. Um, Summing up today's webinar content, this graphic shows when to use which pipetting tool and technique. So for low and medium viscous liquids, classic air cushion pipettes with pre-wetting and reverse pipetting, as well as a very slow aspiration and dispensing speed are recommended or even mandatory. When you have the chance to use a positive displacement device, then do so. It is much easier and less thinking about the liquid and technique. You can use it for all types of viscous liquids. The higher the viscosity, the better it is to use an electronic device. This protects your muscles and simplifies workflow. When using medium or highly viscous liquids, I recommend to use a special tip for viscous fluids. Using this special tip increases accuracy and precision and leads to lower aspiration and dispensing forces, protecting your device and your muscles. Okay. So with all these tips, um, I want to end the main part of the presentation and I would like to ask you a third question, which is very important for me. So I would like to know, how do you rate the content of this webinar? You have four answers again. The first is very good and useful. I will apply the tips and tricks. Second is good and useful. I will try some of the tips. The third is okay, maybe I will try some of the tips. And the fourth is poor, not useful for my work. So I will give you again a few seconds, the time you need to answer the questions. Um, the question, and um, you can already also type in some, some questions you want to ask me for the Q&A session. So I'm very curious on, um, on what you think about the webinar and about the questions you will ask in a few seconds. I will just wait a little longer until everybody makes a choice. So maybe we will wait five seconds more and then we will go on um, to the to the next uh, to the Q and A session. Okay. So I think I think most of you made a choice already. So I think we we can go on. So. Um, you can read more about pipetting techniques also with, for example, volatile liquids like ethanol or methanol if this is also an application you're doing. Um, at the Handling Solutions Help page at eppendorf.com slash pipetting. Um, here you will also find many other tips and background information on pipetting as well as quizzes and games or actual science articles. So it's just nice to read through. Um, let us help to op optimize your work, and thank you very much for listening. I'm looking forward to an interesting Q&A session, and therefore, I would hand over to Alexis again. Thank you, Dr. Henke, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. 
If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer a question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, do you have recommendations for piping PEG 300? Uh, so, uh, so this is a very special question. I would have to uh, look exactly at the, um, at the values for PEG 300, because I'm not sure how high the viscosity is at the moment, so I must check this. Um, I would answer this question via email in the uh, afterwards, because I have to check what PEG 300 is in the viscosity to give a proper tip. I don't want to say anything uh, wrong at the moment. So um, and maybe we can go over to question 27, because many people ask this question, and they might be interested in this answer. Absolutely. Where can one buy special tips, and what are they called? Okay, so thank you for this question. Um, these special tips, they are called visco tips. So especially for viscous liquids, that's the name visco tip. Um, you can buy them at, from Eppendorf. So you can ask the sales rep who's uh, visiting your lab, or you can uh, inform yourself on our website on these visco tips. Um, they are very new. We made them just they just were launched this year. And uh, another question is also, what's the technology of these tips, of these visco tips for highly viscous liquids? Um, so it is mainly a design. So it's a change in the, in the size of the opening and in the whole structure of the tip. There is no coating. There is nothing that might enter the sample. So there you're absolutely safe. They're all tested. Um, it is just a, a design change to optimize work with viscous liquids and flow of viscous uh, liquids. So maybe question number six sounds very interesting. All righty, which pipette do you recommend for pipetting egg yolk? So yeah, I like to answer this because pipetting egg yolk is a very special application as well. Um, you should pipe this definitely with a positive displacement device. Um, and you have to take care that the opening of the tip is wide, so that also larger parts of the egg yolk, such as the umbilical cord, can be aspirated. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would also here, I would recommend using the visco tip because it has a wider opening and uh, than the usual positive displacement tips. So you will much easier um, pipe at the, the egg yolk. We are getting so many great questions, Dr. Hinky. Yeah. These are it's great. Crazy. I, I have to read through all the questions. I can't even choose which to answer because they are so great and so many. Um, so maybe question 43 is also interesting. What about the low retention tips? Are they working well? Yeah, so low retention tips um, are just for detergents. They are optimized to pipe detergents, not for viscous liquids. I mean, detergents also have a higher viscosity than water, but they still have many other um, characteristics. Um, viscous liquids, flow even slower than detergents, and detergents really stick a lot to the plastic. So actually, using low retention tips helps a lot when using detergents, but with viscous liquids, you will have exactly the same result as with normal tips. The viscous fluid will not flow down perfectly, and you will have remaining liquid in the tip. So Unfortunately, it's a different technique, and you, can, you should not use low retention tips with viscous liquids. And um, here we have another question. It's 41. 
also we have, what would you recommend us to use for pipetting liquids that are foamy, very difficult to blow out? Yeah. So foamy liquids, it's another liquid class than viscous liquids, but it's an important question. Uh, foamy liquids uh, have a very high protein content. So this often happens with cell culture medium, for example, or BSA solution. And for foamy liquids, I would recommend reverse pipetting because you skip the blowout. And the moment you skip the blowout, you will not get a foamy liquid. So um, you can also use positive displacement devices, dispensers, if you have multiple samples. But if you just want to pipe it once with air cushion pipettes, reverse pipetting is perfectly. Um, mm -hmm. Here we have, oh, I, let me shortly read through some of the questions. Here is one very interesting question we get pretty often. So question number 30, please. Sure. Should you set the pipe at above the intended dispensing volume when pre-wetting the tip? Actually, ideally, you pre-wet the tip with exactly the volume you want to pipe it later on. So you don't have to fill the complete tip with one milliliter if you only want to pipe at 550, for example. Um, it's, it's absolutely fine to use the set volume, and it saves one more step, saves more time than setting the volume from high to the set volume you need. So, Simply use the volume you want to pipe it in the end. Um, so there, there is one question. This is coming pretty often. Um, so this is just like a summary of the question. Many of you ask if you can have a copy of the slides or if I can share the presentation or forward the presentation. Um, Unfortunately, I am not allowed to share the presentation, but there will be a recorded version. You can listen to it at any time you want. Um, you can also send the link of the recorded version to your colleagues and discuss it. And um, if you just want the summary or just want the, uh, the tips and tricks, um, I would recommend to, to just make a screenshot so it's the easiest but I'm not allowed to share the complete presentation. Yes, and this, this presentation will be available for replay um, through December of 2018. And we have so many good questions today. If um, anything that we don't get a chance to answer today, we will be able to, um, to get those answers to you via the contact information that you provided at the beginning of this webinar. Yeah, okay, so um, mm -hmm. question number 44 is also something nice. All righty, what should the tips be pre-wet with, the viscous liquid or water? Yeah, so since we discussed pre-wetting just like two, two questions before, I chose this uh, question as well. You should always um, pre-wet the tip with the liquid you want to pipette. It doesn't make sense to use water at first and then switch to glycerol because you will uh, dilute your sample, maybe you will contaminate your sample. So always pre-wet the tip with the liquid you want to transfer. Okay, so we got two questions, number 47 and number 48 are uh, quite similar. So you can, if you would please read one of both, Alexis. Absolutely. Is it possible to accurately pipette whole blood? Yes, it is possible to accurately pipette whole blood um, because whole blood is also a little bit viscous. So you can apply the tips I just uh, talked about. Ideally, you should also use a positive displacement device 
because here you're absolutely sure that you accurately piped the whole blood. And the opening of the positive displacement device tips are often a little wider than normal tips, so you can safely transfer all the cells. So, uh, question number 50 is also interesting. Question number 50 is, what about alcohols or DMSO? Yeah, so alcohol is a uh, different liquid class than viscous liquids. It is a volatile liquid. And um, for volatile liquids, it's very, very important. It's mandatory to pre-wet the tip. You can do a very easy test yourself. If you pipe up alcohol without pre-wetting the tip, it will immediately start dripping out of the pipe tip because the air cushion is not saturated with the liquid and it expands and pressures out the liquid. If you pre-wet the air cushion by aspirating a couple of times, you will saturate the air inside the tip and you will delay or even stop the dripping from the pipe tip. This depends on the concentration. If you have a 70% ethanol, pre-wetting will be fine and the pipe tip will not drip anymore. If you are using, for example, acetone and uh, pure acetone, you will only delay the dripping because if the volatility is too high, pre-wetting doesn't work with air cushion pipettes anymore. Um, if you are using a very highly concentrated uh, methanol, acetone, and chloroform, all these dripping liquids, you should also use positive displacement devices. Because of the lack of the air cushion, you will have no dripping at all. Oh, okay, I will, I will read through the, some questions again. Um, maybe number 31 is very interesting. All righty. Thanks for the info. We don't have positive displacement pipettes, so I will stick with weighing. How does weighing viscous liquids compare to positive displacement pipettes? Okay. So um, weighing of the samples uh, has many different influences. So if you, for example, want to weigh glycerol, this liquid is also hygroscopic. So the moment you bring the glycerol to the balance, it starts um, saturating with the humidity in the surrounding air. So by time, it will get heavier and heavier. So this is very difficult to calculate then, back into milliliters, how much sample you really have. So I don't know which liquid you weigh in your application, but you have to consider this uh, as, as a possible problem. And um, weighing is usually not that accurate as pipetting with a positive displacement device because the transfer and the calculating from gram to milliliter is always prone to errors. And you have to take into account the density of the liquid, the air humidity, the temperature. It's almost as complicated as uh, calibrating a pipette, where you have to consider all these factors as well. Um, if you're doing food analysis, this might be something different, because I know that, I don't know if it's the same in every country, but in Germany it is that if you have something to eat, like curd, and it's stated in gram on the packaging, you have to weigh the sample. But if you have something like drinking yogurt, which is stated in milliliter on the packaging, you have to do the analysis in milliliters. And it is much easier then to use a positive displacement device and invest the money into a positive displacement device than calculating and taking all these errors into account. While Dr. Hinky is going through your questions, I do want to remind all of our viewers that um, we will continue, or excuse me, Dr. Hinky will continue to answer the questions during the on-demand period. So 
do not hesitate to throw in a question in there while you're watching while you're rewatching the presentation or if you send this over to your colleagues and they watch it as well. Yes, that's right. Um, here we have question number 45. Which pipette is recommended for pipetting semen uh, for semen analysis? For a semen analysis, I would definitely recommend to use positive displacement pipettes. Um, and I would also recommend using the visco tip because it has a very wide opening, so you would not destroy the the semen at all. Um, and it has um, it's not it's not only viscous, but it also has a very high amount of proteins and other nutrients. So uh, using a positive displacement device is definitely beneficial for pipetting a semen for semen analysis. Um, maybe question 42 is also something many might be interested in. All right. Is it recommended to wipe the outside of the pipette barrel with a wipe before dispensing? No, not at all. So wiping the outside of the pipette barrel um, can lead to some liquid being pulled out by the tissue you're using and you risk that your result is not accurate anymore. So only um, dive into the liquid as much as you need, so only a few millimeters, maybe one or two millimeters deep into the liquid, and while aspirating, just follow the liquid level. Like this, you don't have that much additional liquid around the pipette barrel, and you don't need to wipe it because wiping is always a risk of losing some sample. Okay. And um, question 51 is also important in the lab. About dilution, best direct dilution or serial? So I would recommend, if possible, use direct dilution because you have less errors than doing a serial dilution. If you have a very, very highly viscous liquid and direct dilution is very difficult because you have low volumes, then you must use serial dilution. But if possible, switch to a positive displacement device and do a direct dilution so that you have less error sources. Let me see. Uh, question number. Oh, there are still so many questions. I will have to answer many of them via email. This is so great. Um, maybe uh, 34. Would you please explain more on the concept of, of an electronic stepper? Yes, so um, an electronic stepper is basically the same as a manual stepper, but it has many more benefits because you can, uh, you can choose the speed. So you have a very, very high reproducibility in samples. If you're always using the same speed, it's, um, it doesn't depend on your muscles and your your feelings on the day, so one day you're strong, one day you may be a little tired, so you're slower. With an electronic dispenser or an electronic stepper, it's always the same. And it's also always uh, the same amongst different people. So if many people have to do the analysis, using an electronic stepper guarantees that everybody is doing it the same way. Um, that's also something, especially for routine labs, using electronic devices and using electronic positive displacement devices um, guarantees a higher reproducibility and a lot of security because often you can, um, you can program favorite programs, nobody has to change the program, everybody works with the same. Um, you can also sometimes get in some key lock so that nobody can change anything. This is a security reason. 
electronic steppers have many, many different advantages. Um, most of them also have different programs and different modes. You can use them for multi-dispensing, but you can also use them just for pipetting, so aspirating once, dispensing once. You can use them for automatic dispensing, where you don't have to use your thumb all the time. The device is simply dispensing uh, after a certain time interval, which makes life much easier. And uh, some of them also have like uh, mixing functions and so on. So I'm a great fan of electronic devices, and especially electronic scaffolds make life much easier. So it's, it's worth trying them. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been an absolutely fa fabulous Q&A. We have time for a couple more questions today. Okay, so I'll choose some more. <laughs> mm. So 37. Is a syringe suitable for high viscous fluids? So a syringe can be suitable for highly viscous fluids. It depends a lot on the um, on the design and the shape of the syringe. If it has a very fine opening, like this, um, the ones used for uh, for vaccine. Uh, I, I'm not sure, vaccination, I hope this is the right word, um, the very thin metal uh, part on the syringe, this is way too small to uh, correctly aspirate uh, viscous, highly viscous liquid. So if you need to use a syringe, or if you only have syringes in the lab, try to use one with a wide opening. This will help you aspirating the liquid, and it facilitates your work. Um, if it's not possible to have a syringe with a wide opening, I would not recommend to use one with a very small opening because you need to apply a lot of force to the piston to aspirate the liquid then. And this might be uh, even dangerous. If you pull too much and it breaks apart, you might uh, you know, get hurt or something. So take care that the opening is wide if you want to use highly viscous liquids. Okay. Dr. Hinky, it looks like we will have time for one more question. One more question, okay. Um, question 57. Okay. Dispensing at low volume, say one UL using a 20 UL tip is always a challenge. Minor issues like static humidity tip type make a big difference. It appears low volume pipetting is more of an art than science. Do you have any advice? Uh, yes, we have uh, an advice and you're right. It is more art than science, uh, pipetting very, very small volumes. Um, the first thing you must consider if you need to pipe at small volumes, always choose the smallest tip and the smallest possible pipette. So if you need to regularly pipe at one microliter, then please choose a 2.5 microliter pipette and the according small tip. Because this is a, a problem with the air cushion. The larger the air cushion, the more difficult it gets to aspirate and dispense small volumes, and the more prone to errors the whole system is. So with a very small tip and the according very small pipette, you have a very small air cushion. And um, this helps a lot already when pipetting. The second thing is you have to hold the pipette absolutely vertical while aspiration, and in a 45 degree angle with contact to the vessel wall when dispensing. And pre-wetting the tip with very small volumes is absolutely mandatory because during the first aspiration, if you don't do pre-wetting, so much of the liquid already evaporates into the air cushion that you will never have an accurate result. So pre-wetting with small tips is even more important than with larger tips. 
Um, and if you want to see a, a video on correct pipetting techniques, and there you can also see how to hold the pipette and everything, uh, you can watch on YouTube. There is a, a tutorial video I did. It's called How to Pipet Correctly. There you can see, see the whole pipetting process and get some explanations. Um, this is the way you should also uh, deal with small volumes. Thank you again, Dr. Hinkey. And do you have any final comments for our audience? I thank you so much for all these very interesting questions. There are still so many left. They will be all answered uh, in the next few days. Uh, this is very important for me to answer every question. So thank you very much for being so interactive and listening so well. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by this, uh, this audience. Thank you. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their very, very interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of the registration. We would like to thank, um, we would like to thank Dr. Hankey for her time today and her important research. We would also like to thank Labert and our sponsor Eppendorf for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through December of 2018. Labberts will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. Bye.